that is a huge ask for an 18 year old. <laughs> you know, we are going to prepare you to kill everybody that's in your way. My name is Dan Arcand, uh, from originally from Minnesota, joined the Marine Corps at the age of 17 in 2002 and, uh, served until 2022 as an infantryman. And what rank you got out? I got out as a gunnery sergeant. So I was from a uh, little town right outside the Twin Cities in Minnesota. To be honest with you, I had a great childhood. Uh, parents stayed married, still married. Um, had a little brother that was three and a half years younger than me. I mean, my mom grew up in a military household. Her dad retired from the army, army um, but she was traveling throughout her whole childhood, Germany, Alaska, all over the place. Um, my dad grew up on a farm. Um, five other siblings, very poor. Um, his dad had to drive a truck just to make ends meet. So the bank wouldn't take the farm, but both my parents were great examples. I mean, very loving household, uh, taught us if nothing else, they taught us work ethic. Um, he used to give us allowance on commission. So like every time you take out the trash, you get a nickel and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but just very entrepreneurial. Um, I mean, he grew up with nothing. And by the time I was 18, this family was set. Like they have everything and more that we could ever ask for as kids, but they also taught us to appreciate it. Um, my dad was a Marine. Um, and I remember <laughs> most people can't remember when they're really young, you know? Uh, but when I was about three years old, we did a pro we were doing a project in preschool to take home to our family. What do you want to be when you grow up? And kids were saying, I'm going to be a professional wrestler. Um, you know, I'm going to be an astronaut, all these things. And I was working with the teacher on my project. I said, I'm going to be a Marine like my dad. And the teacher said, was saying, oh, you mean like a GI Joe? And I looked the teacher in the eyes. I said, no, like a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it never it never shifted, never swayed. It was my plan as long as I can remember. I was going to be wearing a Marine uniform like my dad did. Wow. My 17th birthday, <laughs> my dad took me to the recruiter's office. I, I was old enough and eligible to enlist. Um, and I actually, as soon as I enlisted, uh, I went back and talked to my high school guidance counselor. I'm like, what do I need to do to go to boot camp? Like, I don't care about walking at graduation. I just want to go to boot camp. I'm like, well, what if the Marine Corps doesn't work out? What's your plan B? And I just looked at him like they were crazy. Like, plan B, there is no plan B. I'm going to be a Marine. Uh, how do I get out of high school and go to boot camp? <laughs> uh, and I, I still remember, like yesterday, getting to the recruit depot in San Diego. It, it, it was the most amazing thing. I mean, drill instructors put everybody on the yellow footprints and I'm just like, we are about to get messed up. This is amazing. Um, they're having us carry all the cleaning supplies in the squad bay, you know, issuing everything out. And I, my last name starts with an A, so I'm always the first one in line and the drill instructors start screaming alphabetical order, get out the door. And they don't tell you which way to go. So I'm just like, well, we're, we're going to try right. And there's a drill instructor waiting to punches me right in the chest the other way uh and that was that was my first day in boot camp i'm like this is going to be awesome <laughs> so boot camp was i mean if i'm being honest i i was just taking it all in i there was one day where i got lazy um i feel like everybody probably has a moment of weakness at one point in boot camp not everybody will always get caught uh but i got caught <laughs> i was hiding behind the rack uh, while well, the drill instructors were running around having everybody clean and I'm just like, I don't, I'm, I'm not feeling it today. I need a break. And drill instructor walked up behind me and was like, what are you doing recruit? And I said, this recruit's not doing anything, sir. Which of course was the wrong answer. <laughs> um, and what he did was he told me to put rags in each, each of my hands and he had one of my bunk mates lift me up by my feet and he used me as a human mop. And while he was using me as a human mop, he had me going around the squad bay singing a Michael Jackson song. Um, so I'm singing If Your Mother Only Knew uh, in a terrible, terrible voice. I'm not a singer by any means. But the drill instructor started slowly grabbing other recruits to come be my backup singers. And it lasted like a half an hour. I'm just belting out these Michael Jackson songs while I'm getting used as a human mop. It was hilarious. 
Help me. Yeah. Oh, good times. Um, no, it was great though. Made a lot of good friends in boot camp. Um, I do remember they had TV. They always had the newest plan in the chow hall. And, and I remember seeing, um, I was in boot camp while they, they were working up for the invasion of Iraq. And, uh, I remember watching the workup, the, the clips for the workup and everything in the chow hall, like, we need to hurry up. I'm going to miss the war. <laughs> I, I mean, nobody knew that the war was going to last almost 20 years. Um, but as soon as we got out of boot camp and went to school infantry and everything, um, it was accelerated at that point. We, they, they were pushing people through school infantry as fast as they could because they, the, the wars were, were still pumping, you know, we needed to keep fresh troops going into Afghanistan, starting to go back into Iraq and everything. And as soon as I hit the fleet, um, I mean, my first year in the Marine Corps, I lost 20, almost 20 friends. Um, I don't know if you remember back in 2000, I think it was the beginning of 2004, um, the helicopter crash, the Chinook crash in Af Afghanistan killed like 31 people, if I remember right. Um, and 15 of those were in boot camp with me. They were, they were buddies of mine from, from boot camp. Uh, another really good friend of mine, Jeff Perez got shot in, in, uh, in Iraq. Um, I remember when he got shot, I, I, I was tearing up a little bit at that one. That was like my first real good friend that I'd lost. And my platoon sergeant saw me. I mean, we were all at work getting ready for the, to start the day and everything. And my platoon sergeant was walking around and he saw me. And he basically said, you know, stop crying, train harder. This is, this is the life you chose. Um, and it definitely focused me on, on, on what we were doing, but it was interesting because I didn't really get a chance to grieve that loss. I feel like a lot of us haven't properly grieved some of the close friends that we've lost. Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, I'm actually still in touch with that platoon sergeant, but he, he got discharged for PTSD. He got medically retired for, for PTSD. Um, and I asked him about that. I called him a few years back, just asking him about, you know, do you remember this conversation when my buddy died? He's like, yeah, you know, that, that wasn't the appropriate thing to say to you. Um, hindsight being 2020, um, but he basically just said, you know, everybody has a breaking point and we need to be co co cognizant uh, of what that breaking point is if we're going to help people out. I was with 7th Marines most of my career uh, out in 29 Palms, um, a, f a few different battalions out there. Um, it was... God, I don't even know how to explain it. <laughs> I mean, we got, I got there in the middle of the night... Um, the company gunny was there to issue us room keys and barracks rooms and it was it, it seemed like controlled chaos would probably be the way to explain it um for 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 any vets that are watching this i mean you know what it's like showing up to the fleet but i mean the new guy is the fresh meat <laughs> mm -hmm. um and w when i got there it was me and i think there were only three or four other guys that were checking in so we were we were on the chopping block. <laughs> uh, and I mean, there was so much to learn. I mean, the, we, at this point we knew the wars were still going. So everybody was going to be really hard on you because your life depended on it. And so did everybody else's. Um, but at the same time, that's a lot of power to give a 20 year old. That's going to be your new boss. Um, one of the first big experiences I can remember is my squad leader told me to put all my kid on with the gas mask. And me and the new guys were going to clear the barracks. Um, and of course, as we're going up the ladder wells and everything, um, going through the clearing and everything, they would tell one of us that we were casualties. And now we got a fireman carry the casualty up and down the stairs and everything. And that went on for hours um, until we were probably close to heat stroke. <laughs> um the whole point of it being though i mean you have to know what your physical limits are and you have to be able to push through it and it did come in handy on some of the later deployments just remembering 
what your body is capable of if you're willing to do it. So I did uh, Iraq five times, Afghanistan, and then Africa. I went uh, on an individual augment deployment to Liberia. Mm. Um, yeah, Liberia was the highlight of my career, if I'm being honest. Was it? <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about that. So Liberia, um, they just had a coup and, and there was a new government in place. So the Marine Corps was partnering with the National Guard actually um, to sponsor, just advise and assist mission over there to help stabilize their military. Um, I had just finished being an SOI instructor at that time. So they sent me to the Armed Forces Training Center in Liberia to help their instructors create a boot camp curriculum and teach their or their soldiers uh, basic tactics, things like that. So I was there to help them build the schoolhouse. Um, it was in the middle of the jungle. It, it was an amazing time, and it was really just me and one other guy um, living living with the the African soldiers. Um, I guess what the probably the funniest thing I can remember from that time was. So they're obviously a not wealthy country, um, but they like to party. <laughs> so they have what they call palm wine over there. And they basically scale up a palm tree and tap into it and, and insert a little tube. And they drain the sap from the palm tree into a bucket of bleach or whatever they had available to drain it into. And we were out playing, uh, playing spades outside and they were like, hey, do you want to try this palm wine? I'm like, yeah, let's let's go toe-to-toe -to -toe here. <laughs> and so we started taking shots, and I'm like, this tastes like water. Like, what, what are we doing here? And after, I think, 10 or 11 shots of this stuff, they all start snickering because I'm not feeling real good. And what they didn't tell me is the whole thing behind palm wine is it ferments in your stomach. <laughs> so I'm going shot for shot with these guys and they just start snickering because I'm about to fall off my chair I, I'm looking at my hand and I'm like I can't see the numbers straight anymore and I wind up falling off my chair I thought I was going to have alcohol poisoning but I just thought it was the funniest thing in the world uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a great time though they, they took me in um, there was a little village right outside the base that we were at and I, I like to go out there and do some volunteering work and everything. And just, I mean, if nothing else, just play with the kids. And I mean, they could all out dance me, but I'd go out there and just make a fool out of myself and everything just to have a good time. And uh, at the end of the deployment, right before I was going to go back, they invited me to a little, a little, they called it a party they were putting together. And they actually held the ceremony. They made me part of the tribe, um, gave me a whole tribal outfit, gave me a tribal name. Uh, it, it, it was, what was your tribal name? It was called, uh, they called me Makado. Uh, I meant I can see your soul. Um, it was, it, it was a very peaceful, enjoyable experience. I enjoyed that deployment a lot. Nice. Yeah. Iraq, we were, uh, we were on the border of Syria, um, just outside Al Qaim. And that was probably the most casualty heavy deployment that we had. Um, it was also a very eye opening deployment. Um, eye opening in terms of that, that, that was the deployment that I went on that I realized the, my entire career is probably going to be spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, because they, I mean, they would cost, and in the IEDs, we lost a lot of friends from IEDs. But the interesting thing of it was they would attack us on a semi-frequent basis um, and they would always lose, but they never quit. <laughs> you know, and that, that I remember when that kind of finally sank in, it, it, it's a scary thought. Like they're, they're not going to quit and apparently neither are we. This is going to be my entire adulthood if I can survive. It is going to be fighting these guys back and forth until I either get too old or I get killed. <laughs> and to be honest with you, that's when I uh, that's when I started having a rough go at some some things. I'd come, we'd come back from deployment, and I'd drink to forget and drink to fall asleep. Um, 
I mean, I we we'd be walking around the mall, going shopping or whatever in between drinking binges, and I'd see friends that had been killed. I would actually see them walking around the mall. There was one incident. I saw a guy that we'd lost on the deployment before. Yeah, um, I, I swear I saw him in the mall to the point where I took off running after him, trying to chase him down. It was some random, but it, I mean, I could have swore it was him and I was so excited to see his face. And then it, the, the reality sinks in and it's like, well, no, that, he, he's gone. Um, yeah. Um, talk to what kind of missions were you, were you going on in Iraq? Um, so it, a lot of it, a lot of it was, I mean, presence patrols were a huge thing. So you're always looking for presence patrols as far as winning hearts and minds, trying to get the population on your side. Um, that was when the IED threat started getting really heavy. Um, and they got real intuitive with their IEDs as far as changing the placement of where the bombs were, um, starting to use shape charges to puncture all the extra armor that we're putting on. Um, and then raids, doing, doing raids with all the special forces groups and everything that were out there um, trying to capture high-value targets and, and that sort of thing. Um, there was one raid that we went on um, my cousin will appreciate this story if he watches this. Um, so we were out on a raid going, and, and it wasn't, it, it was more just a mass search of this village um, because we, we'd gotten intelligence that they were harboring, harboring uh, insurgents and weapons. So we went to just go search the whole village, and towards the end of the raid, we, uh, we got opened up on. A, a machine gun started opening up on us. And at this point, we had the big, the big trucks, the MRAPs. I was sitting in the back. I was the platoon sergeant at the time. And I always made it a point, if we got shot at, that I was going to be the first one out the door. Um, partially to set the example, partially because at that point in time, I wouldn't have minded getting shot in the face. <laughs> um, but I threw the back door open, and I'm looking out the little glass, the bulletproof glass in the door, and a bullet struck the bulletproof glass like right where my eye was right um we get out we handle the gunfight go to get back in the truck and the bullet's still lodged in the glass i use my leatherman to pull it out and i actually turned that bullet into a necklace for my cousin oh um <laughs> she uh she actually saved my butt um after that deployment, actually, I I went and met up with her to go watch a Floyd Mayweather fight, and I spent the night at her place, and then went to get in the car the next morning. Um, I had a pistol in my car, and I'm just sitting there for probably half an hour, and and I wound up putting the pistol in my mouth. I, I was ready to be done at that point. Um thought thought of her flashed through my head and I pulled the pistol out I called her up I said hey can I come talk to you about a few things and I just had a complete mental breakdown in her house um, she stopped me from killing myself okay. yeah what do you think then was uh um what were you struggling with did did you did you have any idea what was bothering you or making you feel this way I mean it, it was a lot of a lot of friends lost. I, I would boil it down to survivor's guilt. Um, I had had a lot of friends at that point that I'd lost either through combat or through them committing suicide that had left families behind, and I didn't have any family at that point, at least in my mind. I mean, my mom and dad were amazing. My brother's amazing. I'll, I mean, a huge extended family, but in my mind, I didn't like. I don't have a wife and kids, and all these guys did, and they're dropping like flies. Why am I still here? <laughs> And it was, it was taxing me. That and the amount I've been drinking definitely didn't help me keep a clear head. Um, yeah, and I just, I, it was so exhausting. I just wanted to break. You know, I think the scariest moment that I probably had, I don't even know if I'd call it a scary moment. It was more of, I mean, it still haunts me. <laughs> um, 
we were out on a vehicle mounted patrol. And it was right around Christmas time, actually, probably within a few days of this. Um, the truck in front of me blew up. And at that point in time, uh, they started using rocket propellant to really heat up the explosions. The truck was just burning, and I jumped out of my truck and ran to try and help the people that were inside. And the fire was burning so hot that we, I mean, we couldn't even get to the vehicle before our clothes started smoking. Like, we, we were lighting up on fire. Our clothes were lighting on fire before we could even get there. Um, and, I mean, right around the holidays, I'm watching five guys burn alive in that truck. They, they couldn't get out. Um, I'm watching their bodies burn and I still have that dream of, of watching them burn. <laughs> um, and then after the truck is done, in, at least in the dream, they get out of the truck and these scorched bodies are just looking at me while I'm laying in bed. If <clears throat> you... That that was uh, that was probably the worst day I've had. Hey, Dad, talk to me about um, um, what did you guys used to do with, uh, during downtime? Did you have any good times out there um, when you got a moment to you know interact with each other? You, you know, I mean, I know Marines were always fucking with each other. <laughs> and so, do you have any good stories uh, about that? Yeah. Um, so we had, on one of the deployments, we had a guy that wanted to do the Marine Corps version of punked. Um, <laughs> so uh, we had some boxing gloves, um, and what he'd do is he'd give somebody the camera, and right as somebody's getting in their sleeping bag, getting ready to go to bed, he would just pounce on them and start punching them and then run away giggling like a little girl. Um, and they'd get the whole thing on camera. So we decided we were going to set this dude up um we picked the biggest dude in the platoon um i mean you, you're talking arnold schwarzenegger and add like 20 pounds right like just this massive guy we're like hey we're gonna tell kevin to, to punk you um we need you to be in your sleeping bag but be naked and get ready okay and so <laughs> kevin gets ready to go get this guy and right before he's about to jump on this dude the guy jumps out of his sleeping bag and starts chasing him all over the camp stark naked and kevin's like Kevin was like this tiny little 120 pound guy, like screaming. And there's this massive dude, Andrew, chasing him all over the base, uh, just trying to tackle him stark naked. It was so funny to watch. <laughs> that, that was a good one. Um, we had a cook that uh, somehow he'd figured out how to get us strawberries delivered and then started melting chocolate bars and he was going to make us chocolate covered strawberries. And he was super proud of these. They were out drying and everything. And then a rocket came in and for whatever reason, God didn't like strawberries that day or whatever. Um, the rocket hit the, where the strawberries were and blew them all over the place. And then we started getting some uh, insurgents that tried to were trying to probe our wire. And uh, this guy, this cook was so upset that the strawberries got hit. He wound up jumping behind a machine gun in a guard tower and I mean, he wound up smoking like six dudes, uh, wound up getting a, a Nam with a V. He's the only cook I know that has ever gotten a Valor device. But I mean, he just went crazy over those strawberries. Wow, man. Um, you don't mess with the cooked strawberries? Yeah, you don't mess with the strawberries, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he just, so he jumped behind somebody else's gun? Yep. He, he like pushed the dude off of the gun and just needed to unleash some steam, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, you're talking about dealing with mental health and drinking, right? Um, would you say these thoughts would pop up like when you weren't in Iraq and overseas and stuff? Or would, would this happen? Would you be back in the rear and have downtime or? Yeah, I would say, I mean, in theater, I, I was, I feel like I was very focused all the time. Iraq, Afghanistan, was, I mean, for lack of a better term, that was my happy place. Um, I, I was, as soon as we got home, I was ready to go back because 
home didn't feel normal anymore. Um, I loved the training, especially being spending most of my time out in 29 Palms. Training was close enough. I, I was at least getting people ready to survive, you know. Um, but the downtime after working hours, I mean, it, I actually rented a place right across the street from my favorite bar. <laughs> So I could, as soon as I got home, I would change into civilian clothes and walk across the street and get drunk. Um, Because I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what to do with myself between deployments. Um, So home was definitely the much more difficult of the two options, strangely enough. Did you notice anybody else kind of feeling the same way you were? I think it was very prevalent, especially among the guys that we're doing more than four years. Um, it's addicting. The the whole adrenaline is the best drug in the world. <laughs> I don't I don't think you can beat it. I'm I'm not super experienced with with drugs in the first place, I guess. But that uh, that adrenaline high is something else. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any of the both stories? I have so. <laughs> I had a, uh, I had an incident. It, it, we'd just gotten back from one of my tours in Iraq. I don't even remember what year this is at this point. Um, I went down to Palm Springs. We were going to go party, but I wound up getting super drunk too early in the night. And I walked down the street from the hotel to a liquor store and, uh, Bought another bottle and in a 12 pack of beer and I'm walking out of the store and this, I'm assuming homeless guy walks up to me. He's like, Hey man, you got a dollar? Like, no man, I just spent all my money, which was a lie. (laughs) Um, but he pulls a 38 special out of his pocket and says, give me your bottle. And he grabbed the bottle out of my hand. I'm standing there like, what the hell is happening right now? He turns around, runs away, trips in the parking lot. The bottle shatters all over the street. And I'm still just standing there like, are you kidding me? Like, I literally got back that night and all I wanted to do was have a bottle of Southern Comfort to myself. And this guy just shattered it all over the parking lot. And all I did was turn around, went back in the store and bought another one (laughs) and just walked back to the hotel like nothing happened. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yeah. What'd he do? Just get up and keep He running. just went, went, kept running. Wow. It, it was bizarre. That whole incident was just very, very bizarre. <laughs> How'd you feel when he had a 38 pointed at you? I, I didn't even register until several days later, to be honest with you. I was more concerned about the alcohol. <laughs> okay. You're being in a leadership position, feeling like this, but yet you are tasked with training these younger Marines and preparing them to be war fighters as well. How do you balance that out? And is there anything, if you wanted to get help for feeling how you're feeling, uh, is the Marine Corps doing anything for combat vets like in your situation? Five, six tours, seven tours or so, you know? You know, I think the amount of resources that are out there are it's actually very impressive the problem is pride gets in the way Mm. um i mean when i was much younger sergeant and and a junior staff sergeant it was constant i mean even after work i would just stay in the barracks and keep these guys after work to teach them because i felt like that was the right thing to do we don't have time to blow off steam we got to get ready for the next go um, I didn't actually seek help until I was probably at my 17 year mark. <laughs> you know, I'm like thinking about, well, I got a kid now. I'm getting close to retirement. This is not the way I want to, this is not the headspace I want to be in when I'm, when I'm done with this. Um, but I mean, between the vet center was a great resource. Um, I mean, combat vets can go to the vet center and just talk amongst other combat vets and that's a that's a comfortable area i was fortunate enough to have a great uh a great psychologist that didn't necessarily i don't want to put it like this but he doesn't really believe in drugs (laughs) 
Um, so he's not there to prescribe you a bunch of narcotics and pump you full of stuff. Um, he's just there to help you work out the problems. Um, another great one that I went to is, I don't know if you're familiar with Mighty Oaks. Mm -hmm. Um, Mighty Oaks does a great retreat for, for anybody with PTSD, first responders, um, military, all sorts of different people, but, uh, they'll bring you out to like, they have one location in Southern California here where it's like a 25,000 acre ranch that the owner just lets them have a retreat and it's, it's faith-based. Um, and I mean, you go out and ride horses and then just talk about stuff and work it out and just try and get your headspace right again. Um, the resources are plentiful. It's the pride and the way the the way you worry about how people are going to view it that that people run into problems. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, you know, earlier you talked about wanting to take your life, and you know, a lot of us always hear about you know veterans and the big problem uh, with suicide within the veteran community. Is suicide a problem in the active duty community as well? Yeah. Um, just in my unit this year, we've had three, three non-combat vets, um, take their own lives right in the barracks. Um, one of them was, a, I think it was right before Thanksgiving last year, um, hung himself in his room. His roommate wound up walking in on him, hanging from the ceiling. And Such a waste. What do you think? That, why, why do you think these guys are are committing suicide like this? I have my theory. <laughs> um, one, I mean, you 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 try and mold these kids that haven't even fully psychologically developed yet into raw. We're gonna go kill everything that moves. This is what the country needs from you. And that's a huge, I mean, if you stop and think about it for a minute, that is a huge ask for an 18 year old, <laughs> you know, we are going to prepare you to kill everybody that's in your way. Um, and you try and normalize it, but that's not, that's not normal behavior. Um, especially for somebody that's brain isn't fully developed yet. And then you pack them in a, in a building that's full of other people that, it was, I mean, in a lot of cases, probably people that weren't going to go to college anyway. Um, but it's the same thing as a college dorm room. Don't drink if you're not 21. Okay. You know, and our, our solution is always, whenever something bad in your life happens, our solution is let's go get him drunk and he'll forget about his problems. You don't want to go on a hike or go learn how to surf or something that's physically productive. We're going to get you tanked and everything's going to be okay. I mean, you might as well just go get them loaded on drugs and have them drive a car. Um, and then a lot of it too is just, I mean, the, the nature of the people that we're working with, you try and internalize it, you know, and we're, we're sending these people on all sorts of different missions around the world, Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, everybody's all up, worked up about China right now and who's going to be the next fight. Yeah. I mean, most of these guys, the only world travel they've done, they've done with a gun in their hand. Um, it would be great to have these guys do some traveling and do some more volunteer work and things like that so they can see a brighter side of humanity. <laughs> I would, I would, for the last few years, I've been trying to figure out what I'm going to do after the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, that what, what, what I've come up with at this point is, I've had so many friends commit suicide at this point. I, I have to do something to try and help the problem. Um, so we, we're, we're founding an organization called, we're calling it Peace for Warriors. Um, and the whole concept here is we are going to sponsor veterans with PTSD to go and do volunteer work internationally. Um, we've made some connections with people in the Philippines, Nepal, Tibet, that are school building organizations. We're going to send these guys to go volunteer and 
um, either help the construction of the school or just deliver books and help mentor the kids. We've made some connections in South Africa with just some like big brother type programs. Um, I want to take some of them back to my old stomping grounds in Liberia because they are always looking for volunteers in that area of the world. Um, but the whole concept is just, don't get me wrong, like service dogs and all these other things are amazing. Um, but I feel like if you give a veteran a service dog, somebody that's suffering from PTSD, they don't have to worry about focusing on people and being part of society anymore. They can just focus on the dog, right? If we send them to volunteer and they can get, they can make a kid smile because they just delivered their favorite book or they're, they're helping them learn anything, working with them to build a new schoolhouse for the village, whatever the case is, they are interacting with people in a way that is going to be joyful. Um, and my hope is that they will have a similar experience that I had in Africa volunteering where you see a glimmer of hope in the world and you're not worried about who's going to shoot me in the back anymore. <laughs> you, you, you're just making a positive impact. Uh, where could people find out about uh, Peace for Warriors? So we got a website up and running now, uh, Peace for uh, Peace for the number four warriors.org. And then Peace for Warriors is on Facebook and Instagram as well. And mm. keeping regular updates. I do remember when I was a sergeant, um, there there was a field op that we were on that I, I, I had this kid. I'm, I'm going to not say his name for his sake. <laughs> um, but he was an overweight Marine, constantly struggling in every aspect of being an infantryman. And we were just doing presentation and mag reload drills and some white space that we had in the field. And uh, he got exhausted to the point where he just couldn't hold up his rifle anymore. And I went berserk. I, I wound up grabbing his rifle by the barrel and I used it as a baseball bat. <laughs> um, just lost my mind. And after that incident, I got selected for meritorious promotion to staff sergeant. You know, like, oh my God, this guy's a fire breather. He, all he does is work. And it's like, that's the mentality I had for most of my career after I picked up sergeant it was like, everything has to be about combat and everything has to be intense. I am slowly starting to realize that that might not work in the civilian sector uh, as, as far as the intensity goes and everything. Um, and the, the whole transition program that the, the military in general has now is actually great. Um, the week-long transition seminar that you go to has a lot of really valuable resources. The problem is people don't want to attend it because they see it as a check in the box. But, I mean, you can have a guy that's going to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and fill out your whole resume which, I mean, if you look online for resume program, resume writers and everything, I mean, you're paying a thousand dollars for that kind of thing. Um, you're getting, you have to do it for free <laughs> before you get out. Um, the VA resources that are out there, the mental health resources that are out there are huge. It's just people don't take advantage of them the way they should. It's kind of a shame. Um, the biggest thing I tell every Marine that I cross, though, is, get what you're owed, you know, the, the transition programs that they have out there, the VA programs that they have out there, all the nonprofit programs that are out there. Don't feel guilty about using it, whether you've seen combat or not. You've done more than 99% of the rest of the population just by doing one enlistment. Like, get what you're owed. Take care of yourself. You earned it. Yeah, I think there is... Um... I think within the veteran community, there's this kind of stigma with non-combat vets feeling like they, they shouldn't feel like they, they're depressed or have anxiety if they didn't go see combat, right? And so they're, they, they, they feel a little bit lost of like, why do I feel this way? I didn't go to combat. And then I've since learned this from my good friend, Dylan Bender, who I talked to you about as a, a Marine recon veteran, now a therapist, specialized in psychology. And, uh, he talks about the psychological condition of becoming a warrior and then going into the military 
Um, you're constantly training for a mission. Um, you're constantly on the move, you know, and then you get out and you're not constantly on the move. Yeah. And that could just hit you quick, right? The beautiful thing about the military is, I mean, it's such a hodgepodge of different people, you know, like one of, one of my, one of my favorite corpsmen was a Wiccan. Like he, he practiced, believed in witchcraft, you know, but he was just a cool dude and he's hanging out. His roommate was like a diehard Catholic and they just loved each other, you know? It, the military should be an example for America. Like everybody gets along, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of background you came back from. Um, you could be poor, you could be rich, you know, could be a goth, you could be a jock. Like everybody just gets along because it's a, it's a collective mission. It's a community that, I mean, by necessity, um, but everybody just gets along so well. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, the, the way you can just take people from all walks of life and turn them into family. You know, walking through a barracks on a Saturday is one of my favorite things to do. It's like going to 17 different nightclubs in one building. <laughs> right. <laughs> Every room's a different character. Huh? Right, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's so much fun. It is. Um, I, 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 w I wish the rest of the population could get on board with that kind of community. America would be a completely different place. Yeah, yeah. That's funny because that in and of itself, just going and fucking visiting different barracks rooms. Yep. It's a whole different experience. You know, you got one guy from fucking the Midwest, this other guy is a little LA gangster. Yep. <laughs> then this is a guy's from the East Coast and everybody has different accents and we're all making fun of each other. All the Boston Marines are talking about, let's go to the bar, fucking bar. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. It's a blast. Yeah. Going out with your squad, squad night out. And you got like two guys in cowboy boots and Wranglers and you got another guy that's got sagging jeans and. <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. You walk into a country bar and half of them look like they're from East LA. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Dan. We're going to get ready to wrap it up, brother. Um, any last words before we cut the tape? No, man. Oh, this was awesome, though. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for being here, sir. Appreciate it. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more.